Oyo it's very much related to what we did. And uh, as students, we did some things which today, I think, so why are students here not understanding they could do these non-violent things okay. and achieve more? Okay. Yeah. Which are some of these things that you're talking about? Right. right. Um, there was in Australia a South African embassy which preached the most incredible racist things. And it was very popular with Australians because, of course, you travel cheaply to southern Rhodesia, you travel cheaply to South Africa. One of the students from our hall, Bill Gamage, went and had a demonstration on his own saying we should stop sporting ties with South Africa. And I asked Bill, why, why are you saying that? And he said, are you aware that all the teams from South Africa are selected on racial criteria? We don't want them here. Because in America, if you look, the best sports people are black. So why do these whites want to lie to the world? This was a white person, okay. Bill Gamage. So he really made me understand a thing that I had not understood. And uh, I was in my first year at university. And so at that time, this would be 1965, 66, among Australians, they started, the young people started to understand that what was happening in South Africa and in Rhodesia was very wrong. And they started organizing. And of course, they called us to be the face of that. Yes. For me, that was not good enough. I thought, now, where are the Aborigines in all this? How do we, in other people's land, do our own fight? Yeah. So we looked for them. So one day I was walking in Sydney, and this beautiful black woman was walking with another black woman, very beautiful, and there this white man carrying their bags. And I dragged them. I said, who are you? I'm Sekai Hove. I'm from... No, I was now Holland. I'm Sekai Holland. I'm from Zimbabwe. They took me to their office. It was called Fakati. And she was in, they were islanders. Okay. And uh, this, the, 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 one was an islander, one was an aboriginal. Okay. Faith Bangla and Dulcy Flower became my best friends. And they became my eyes into the aboriginal community. And they introduced me to the whole plethora of what I had been looking for since I arrived in Australia. Okay. There was a place called Redfern where the young, younger than me, uh, were organizing politically. Okay. And uh, that's how we then just got into the whole mix of things with organizing against the Australians playing sports with South Africa. Right, what did we do? Um, I'll just hone in on the final victory one. Yes. Um, the unions, the students, the faith-based, the Australian Council of Churches, like the Zimbabwe Council of Churches, yeah. if we understood the importance of the World Council of Churches, we would be so embracing of the Zimbabwe Council of Churches. Okay. Because at the forefront of the struggle against apartheid, was the World Council of Churches. And the Australian Council of Churches and the different people here in Rhodesia who had the faith-based approach were linked to that. There was a department uh, called the uh, department against, the World Council of Churches Department Against Racism. It coordinated all the anti-apartheid movement groups into its own department to see what they could do in terms of policy changes, support. So they came to Australia to work with us on getting the Aboriginal groups linked to the department. Okay. And Brigelia Bam, who became the ZEC director in South Africa, okay. she was a young 
social wor wor worker who got a job in the World Council of Churches in the section against racism with someone called Spies, Spivey. They traveled around the world getting all these properly institutionalized. And so very young as students, we got linked to the Americas through the African, Stockley Carmichael. Black is beautiful. He married uh, Miriam Makeba. Um, we, we got linked into a whole lot, you know, when the Black Panthers were doing their thing, they came a branch in Australia of the Black Panthers. Anyway, what did we do on Zimbabwe? Mm. Before, before that, mm. Miss Ola, you have this, this sharp memory, you remember names, remember places, and so on. Mm. This, this sharp memory, our generation don't have that sharp memory. You don't want to have it. <laughs> but let me say this now. Mm -hmm. uh, there was in this whole way we were organizing. A young, young boy in London called Peter Hain was born in Kenya, became a South African citizen, and eventually left for the UK. They started something called sports, uh, you know, it's no sporting ties with apartheid. Mm -hmm. So we invited him to Australia. Okay. And what we did there was to ensure that we upset all the sporting events. If you go back, there is a film called um, Political Football. Can you put that down? You won't recognize me. I don't recognize myself in the film. I'm so young. Um, we organized to totally disrupt the whole uh, tournament. So the unions mm -hmm. found out where the Springboks were going to be hoteled. Okay. And you know the rules in South, the laws in South Africa forbade black and white marriages. And so you couldn't, they couldn't stay in a hotel where there was a mixed couple. Mm -hmm. So we were booked there by the unions. So when we arrived, the hotel was shocked. They had booked us in there with the Springboks. And the Springboks had paid a huge sum of money. So Holland walked there and he says, what are you saying? They say, no, you can't sleep here for four nights. We have, the, the hotel is full. He says, no, we booked four weeks ago. This is our room. And they were shocked. Yeah. <laughs> so we were given the west room, which was on a balcony facing the ground, exactly what we wanted. So we had something like 10,000 young students from all over Australia shouting all night, go home, spring box. Hox on the box, it's the syphilis on the... Um. It was bad <laughs> the whole night. Yeah. And uh, we were standing on the balcony waving all night. All night. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, when they were playing, we were asleep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't play because they were, we were tired. tired. Yes, yeah. But we went to the crowns. They put a pig with oil and we were a married couple carried the cot into the grounds let the pig into the ground <laughs> when the match started and then all the demonstrators ran onto the ground with whistles <laughs> anyway but where were you getting all these guns well Students were students. Listen to the West one. There was a Rhodesia was Information a Center. And these young people got Jim and I to get into the car. Jim never told me what they had organized. We went to the Rhodesia Information Center, and they all walked in, these white kids. I didn't know what they were doing there. But they said, we want to migrate to Rhodesia. And these silly, silly workers believed that 15, 30, Australian students would want to migrate to Rhodesia, so they gave them these forms to fill out. When they were stamped and they had paid, they locked the workers in the toilets, their own toilets. And they took all the documentation, everything. And uh, we went and had the press conference to say, we've taken over the Rhodesia Information Center. It's now called the Free Zimbabwe Center. And the director is Sekai Holland. And we are at number 98 Ruthven Street, our house, our spare bedroom became. We went to the Supreme Court. We said, 
the sanctions don't allow Australia, Portugal, the United States to have a Rhodesia Information Centre. It's against sanctions. We lost the case, but soon after that, um, all the Rhodesia Information Centres were closed in Sydney, in Portugal, and in New York because of our action. So we were never arrested or charged. Okay. But the guts for people to lock workers, yeah. into, there were no cell phones. <laughs> yeah. There were no cell phones. They dismembered the phones, allowed them out, so they couldn't. But we ran uh, London, Buckingham Palace, to say we've taken over the Rhodesia Information Centre, the new director. We rang the Australian Prime Minister, Gough Wicklam, and told him we'd taken over the... They didn't know what to do, yeah. because there were sanctions saying this could not be done and the governments were breaking the law. Okay. So what I'm saying is what beats me in Zimbabwe with students mm -hmm. is that they do not have positive perceptions of how you deal with what you do not want. Because fighting people who are in power before you have a strategy, you will always lose. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. We did a lot of things, mm -hmm. a lot of things. Mm -hmm. When now, for the first time in 26 years, Labour Party won. Mm -hmm. Gough Wicklam's first visitor to Australia was Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Okay. So again, as students, there was not a day when Gough Wicklam said, we recognize the liberation movements. But when he won the elections in 1972, 50 years ago this year, mm -hmm. his first announcement at his town hall was, we stop all stop sporting ties with South Africa. This is 1972, mm -hmm. until democracy comes to South Africa. There was no sporting tie between Australia and South Africa until 1995, when Mandela okay. wore the jersey yes. and went to Australia. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's us who stopped that.